All right, everybody, welcome. This is the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. Every week we try to bring you stories that we think will inspire you. As Rotarians, we're into service above self, and we find cool and innovative to make the world around us better. Uh, our club, the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley, has a special interest in innovation, entrepreneurship, and education. Uh, and, and so every time we get to see a, a story that has something to do with taking a look at the world, and, and, and treating it in a new way, we get pretty excited about the possibility of sharing it. Uh, you read his bio coming in. Uh, I, I just know him as Sam because uh, we've had a chance to talk several times, but he is one of the founders of New Story. And New Story is, is, is one of those wonderful stories of people stopping and saying, we should do something about this. And you are about to learn his story on that front and we are excited to have him. So everyone, please welcome Sam Ballmer. Thank you, Rushton, and thank you to the club. Uh, thanks for having us, really appreciate it. I'm excited to, to talk to a group of people that are excited about what we do. So uh, thanks for having me, I'm gonna dive right in. And yeah, please save all your questions because that's where we really get to the, the fun nitty gritty stuff. Um, awesome, so some of you may have read a little bit about us, watched a video, seen some 3D printing, not quite sure. Um, but I want to take you back to the, the beginning of news story and really starting on small innovations and small changes. And just like Russian said, um, you know, saying that's, that's not okay and we can do something about that. And our story really starts in Haiti. Um, our co-founder and CEO, Brett Hagler, actually visited Haiti in 2010, or sorry, 2014. Um, the Haiti earthquake of 2010 was, you know, catastrophic and the country is still recovering to this day. But what Brett was really blown away by when he first visited was the fact that there were not really people living in reconstructed homes or remade homes after the earthquake. There had been $13 billion given to Haiti by outside funders. And all he could see were, you know, kind of tents and makeshift tents that should have lasted maybe a couple months and were there four or five years later. These were families that had been used to a home had lost their home in the earthquake and were now living out of whatever they could. So obviously there was some problem. Now, this is an example of, you know, the shelter of one of the families that we housed in the first community. Um, and you can actually see here, the, the white and orange is one of these kind of makeshift temporary shelters that was given out um, by the Red Cross and other organizations after the earthquake. The Red Cross actually raised $500 million and built 130,000 temporary homes. But by 2015, they'd only built six permanent homes. So there was no transfer of wealth. There was no continued support. And ultimately, you know, we see there's a problem here. There are people, you know, living without shelter. Nothing's being done about it. But what we really felt um, was that this was a problem of transparency. So what is the problem? What is, what is the problem behind the obvious problem of homelessness? And in this case, we felt that charities were not being held accountable um, by their donors, um, by the people they are serving. There is no transparency about how funds were being, you know, how donors' funds were being used in these communities. And so ultimately, $13 billion was used inefficiently, and nobody to this day can really say where a lot of that went. So this was kind of the, the budding idea of New Story. And our first innovation, it all starts small, and I think that's really core to what makes this new story is thinking, thinking big, but starting small. And our 100% model is, is really what got us started. We are just a, a crowdsourced fundraising platform. And our whole goal was to have 100% of the dollars you donated go to the family that you were paired to. That wasn't, you know, 2% goes to new story, 20% goes to new story. It was 100%. So we actually have one bank account um, that is all to the families. Everything you donate goes strictly to the families, local labor, local materials. And we have one other bank account that is funded by what we call the builders. And these are high net worth individuals, um, companies, private individuals, basically, that really fund all of our overhead and R&D. And this was kind of the initial innovation. But it really didn't stop there. As we got more involved in housing um, and just kind of, you know, working with local organizations, local governments, we realized that there was a lot to be done in the nonprofit world and in the construction world. 
nonprofits are not the most efficient model. I wouldn't say they're the most modern business model. And our goal was to really level up nonprofits, but also construction. So we started working with governments, um, building design processes, getting people we knew in San Francisco to actually help us build holistic, full communities instead of just taking dollars, putting up temporary homes and saying, well, the people are better off. I mean, that's not the world we live in today. That's not data driven. Um, and so we wanted to do better and we started innovating. That takes us to today. In 2020, we built 24 communities with 2,400 homes, 14,000 people living in those communities, and we've raised about $30 million. But it really feels like a news story is just getting started because throughout this time, we've realized that this is nowhere near enough. I mean, 14,000 lives, you could pat yourself on the back and say that's great, but as you'll see, we've got 1.6 billion people living without adequate shelter across the world, and that's supposed to double in the next 30 years. Technology is growing faster than ever, yet this housing deficit is growing faster than ever as well, right? How can that be? We need to do better. I think it's partially on the nonprofit side, leveling those organizations up, and also on the construction side. If you look at the construction industry in terms of innovation, it is one of the least innovative, sorry to say, um, industries out there. And you'll actually see that only, uh, sorry, um, only 0.5% is actually invested in R and D innovations and it's 13% of the global GDP. In addition, it's not a very diverse industry. And so what we've found is that a lot of these innovations that are happening are happening in silo and they're not making it to the people that actually need them most. So our thought as news story was, how do we take first world technology and bring it to developing countries that actually need it now, not in 15 years when we've fleshed it out and the wealthy people have all used it and decided that that could be great for the people in Haiti that needed it in 2010, right? So this brings us to our modern day mission. We pioneer solutions to end global homelessness. We started out trying to build as many homes as we could. Now our focus is more on empowering nonprofits, governments, and other organizations that build homes to build more homes faster, better, stronger, and cheaper, right? I mean, the Panamanian government, for example, during its last term had $5 billion to spend on housing. If we can increase their efficiency by 25%, reduce their costs, they can build way more homes. They can build better communities that people actually stay in, homes that don't fall apart, uh, and really just exponentially increase the impact all through technology. So our model has really become create, prove, share. We build probably somewhere between 500 and 1,000 communities each year, or sorry, 500 and 1,000 homes per year. And the goal with those homes is to create innovations, test them in the communities, and then share them once we've tested and proved them with governments and other nonprofits. That could be the Panamanian government, it could be Habitat for Humanity, it could be the city of San Francisco, if the right technology applies to their situation. So these are the first three innovations that we have come up with, and there are many more to come from VR software, um, surveying software, um, many, 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 many ideas in the works, but these are the three that we have proved so far and that we are now starting to share at this phase at News Story. And the first one is a, like a data impact tool that basically lets you do offline surveying and build your own data program. What we've seen is that so many of these nonprofits are not collecting any data or they're all doing it by paper. How do they actually know that their organization is improving? How do they actually know that the homes are impacting these families the way that they think they are? You've probably heard about this one, 3D home printing, um, this is buzzworthy and we'll get back to this in a little bit, but this is obviously about reducing construction time, lowering costs, increasing sustainability, and building more homes more quickly. And then the last that we're, we're really pushing out and I think is one of the most important but gets the least mentioned is this lean participatory design process. Um, and that's basically bringing in the recipients of these homes to actually say what do they want in their community? Why don't they want to live over there? Why would you live over here? Why do the old people want to live 
on the outskirts of the community when they want all the young families inside so they can keep an eye on the children and keep the noise at a minimum. There's all of this feedback that we as someone who doesn't live in the community will never know. And so actually involving the local people in the decision-making and in the process has been game-changing. So the impact tool, um, we're currently using it in our communities and we're starting to pilot it with the Panamanian government, the Mexican government and the El Salvadoran government. And they are using it now to survey and basically record data across slums in their various countries. And the goal here is that with enough data, they can start figuring out how to precisely um, work on fixing issues in their communities. Here you'll see, this is lean, lean participatory design, it's a mouthful. Um, this is actually a picture and we bring the families in at least twice to do workshops and they actually build and draw and design the community on their own. We have them present it, what they want, what their dreams are, and then we will actually go back, work with our designers to incorporate as much of that as possible while bringing our technical expertise to the equation. And then last and most buzzworthy is the 3D home printing project, which is obviously quite exciting. Um, so we started working on this about two years ago with our partner Icon in Austin, Texas. And I think it was South by Southwest 2017, we debuted the first 3D printed home in the US to Miami Day Standard, totally legal, everything certified. Now, currently, we are working on the world's first 3D printed project, Nakahuka, which I would love to highlight for you today. So, Nakahuka is in Mexico, southern Mexico, and it's one of our biggest projects yet. It's been a little delayed because of COVID and some complications, but this is a 75-acre plot of land. Um, there's going to be commercial areas in the front, a community center, a cemetery, sport courts, water treatment plant, um, and there's actually going to be 500 total units of housing, and 200 of those will be built by New Story, 50 of which are the 3D printed homes. Why aren't we building the whole thing 3D printed? We want to do this slow. We want to do this right. We want to do this the best way possible for these families. And so we're really taking our time and not cranking out homes. You'll probably have seen some, some estimates on how long this takes we want to make sure each home is built to the standard of the family that is living in it. So we're only doing 50 in this first community. Here is a, a shot of the printer actually in action on the second home in Nakahuka. Um, and I have some fun facts for you. The concrete takes about 14 minutes to dry to the point that the next layer can go on top of it. So it prints layers. It's like toothpaste. It literally looks like a toothpaste gun. Uh, it takes 17 minutes to print one full layer for a home design and there's 104 layers per home. We actually print two homes at once because it takes time to cure. And so what we'll do is we'll print the base layer of one home and the track will move over and print the base layer of the next home and then go back and back and forth and back and forth. These are the little efficiencies that as we work on this project, our speed and our quality is getting better every home we've built. I think we've finished about 15 homes now and the speed from the first one to the 15th one as well as the quality has gone up tremendously and the icon team is already working on the next iteration of this machine um, because there's so many learnings to take into account really interesting obviously we built this printer to use in the developing world and that means it needs to work in hum you know humid environments it needs to work in places you can't easily get electricity so this machine is designed to come in on a truck be easily dismantled, packaged back up, and you know, portable around the community. Um, but also it has to deal with humidity. Humidity can really affect the viscosity of the concrete, which can ruin the entire home. So the machine actually has a sensor that will test the humidity, test the temperature of the air, and adjust the concrete mix appropriately so that the home dries and cures at the proper level. It's really complicated. The team is really good at what they do, um, and we've got a lot to learn, but we're amazed that this is the progress so far. So this is the first home. It's been staged, so it looks lovely, and the furniture's all there. Um, but it's two to three bedrooms, depending on what you choose. Uh, you know, eventually the families will literally have an iPad with 10 or 15 designs, and you come in and you say, 
oh, you know, we only have one child and we want to run a storefront business. And so we'll actually choose a design that gives you a large window in the front, one less bedroom so you can prioritize your business versus a family of six that might want a room where they can have bunk beds. They want a little less space in their bedroom for their extra child. You can choose all of that. The way that the printer actually works is we print all the concrete and we come back in after and we put in the wiring, we put in the plumbing, uh, and we put on the roof. But everything else is printed and then negative space is left for all the internal mechanisms. So this is the community of Nakahuka, and I really wanted to give you just a little highlight of that because it's, it's kind of our priority for the year at this point. The Mexican government has given us a very clear deadline. Um, we need to have this done by the end of 2020, and obviously we started this back before COVID, so now we are kind of under the gun. Um, everybody is hustling on this thing, and this is really kind of our priority for the year. So I want to share a couple ways that you guys can get involved. Obviously, um, you could donate. Um, you could donate any amount to the community of Nakahuka. Like I said, it's our 100% model, so everything goes completely to the families. It doesn't matter, you can donate a dollar, you can donate 10, you can donate 10,000. All of it will go to the family. We have programs for donors that want to be more engaged and involved with News Story over time. And that's called the Architects Program. Happy to share more for anyone that's interested or thinks they know someone that's interested. Part of what really makes news story uh, tick, I would say, is our, our networking ability. We're a young team. We know we don't know everything and we want to learn. And so if people know anyone that is interested in housing or has connections that can help us learn, get involved with other governments and organizations, connections and referrals is honestly the best way to help out news story because there's so many people interested in this and all it takes is the right conversation to get some magic going like this 3D printer, honestly. And then last, we've got, some, we've got some job postings to share, honestly. It's really tough uh, hiring right now. And for a nonprofit, when you're, doing, when you're hiring for a director of development and a digital marketer. So, of course, I'm sure you guys have great networks, and we would love if you could share these with your, with your network. Um, those are the best ways to get involved. I don't want to get too deep into everything because there's a lot to ask. So please reach out about any specific questions. And at this point in time, would love to, to get some questions and to go into more detail. Um, there's also some additional slides at the end of the presentation for those that want to learn a little bit more um, about these tools and these innovations. Um, but why don't we start there? And thank you so much for your time. Perfect. Thank you, Sam. Go ahead and stop sharing. We'll introduce the folks that we've got on the recording. Uh, so my name is Rushton. I am a, a, a past president of the uh, Rotary Club of Silicon Valley. Uh, we have with us in the order that I see people wave when uh, I call your name. We have Ferheen Abasi in Santa Clara, our membership director. We have one of our newest members, Gabby Lopez in Salt Lake City. We have our current president, Raquel, uh, Dr. Raquel, as I like to think of her, who is maybe she is frontline worker on, 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 on the COVID uh, on the COVID front. We have Cecilia Babkirk, our vice president and a recent returnee from Ethiopia, where she was a Peace Corps volunteer. We have our paella master, Stephen Shag Shagrin in Walnut Creek. And uh, joining us from the Stanford Peninsula Alumni Club is Kuldeep Ambasta. Uh, Kuldeep, very good to have you with us as well. All right, so uh, Sam, I know that I think Cecilia got her hand up first with regard to, to a question. So <laughs> Cecilia, it, it is yours. Yeah, like in your first three sentences, I had multiple questions, but um, so, are you prepared to go to places like Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda? Um, seems to me like this technology would be really useful in some way in refugee camps, um, of which there are a number of very large ones. And, you know, of course, meant to be temporary, but become permanent. Um, so if you could address that, but also, can you use this technology, do you think, to build school classrooms? and? How much does it cost to build one of those classes, those homes, um, just as an example? Yeah, great questions. Um, so to answer your first one, so New Story directly builds, you know, is building probably 500 to 1,000 homes per year. That being said, we want this technology everywhere. Our goal is to spread it to anybody and everyone, right? So we're kind of at this inflection point where we need to scale it to a point that we can, we can get it to Kenya and we're ready to have that conversation with the Kenyan government. Um, so yes, the goal is to work there. 
I don't think we'll actually be working directly building our communities in Kenya, but we've already been in contact with the Kenyan government, the Rwandan government. Many people in Africa have all been like, we need this now, refugee centers, schools. Um, moving on to your second question. Mm -hmm. I hope that answered that. Um, the printer, they're I mean, the printer can print multiple stories. The current version does not. Um, but the company that we work with, Icon, our partner, they have goals to start working on affordable housing in the U.S., more for-profit. Um, but this printer can build anything, and they want to build everything. We just wanted to start with affordable housing. So it would probably be modular in the way that we build schools um, sure. because the printer is a box, right? So it goes back and forth, and it's not going to yeah. be as big as a school, but you could easily print a classroom, a hallway, um, so ultimately, yes, this will be applied to all of that. And what was your third question? Um, well, how much, how much does it cost oh, much? to build a home? You know, I have about a thousand other questions, but in the interest of not taking everyone else's time, <laughs> these no three of that. <laughs> um, Yeah, so the, the cost is a little up in the air, and I can't give you a, a conclusive cost on what of we're course. doing now, because the cost sure, is actually... Some of this uh, some yeah. of it, I'm sure, is local, you know, availability of local resources and what those cost. But anyway, it, yeah. say in Mexico, what is it costing? Yeah. So the first home that we built slowly, I would say, I think took about $13,000. Um, so lower. Um, and that was actually done a little bit more nicely because we wanted to, we were building it as a test for an organization that was using it as an office. So it's about $13,000. A home can be built in 24 hours. A team will, can run the printer at its top speed, 12 hours, and then assemble the other 12 hours. So a three, four person crew really could build a home in 24 hours. Now, are wow. we doing that today in the community in Mexico? Not exactly. We're taking our time, we're busting pipes, the heat's crazy, things are happening, right? So we're learning, but with optimizations, the team has projected that this could get as low as 6,000 and you could run the printer as fast as 12 hours, print two homes and have a team coming behind roofing and plumbing everything. Wow. Yeah, because my community in Ethiopia, I mean, all of Southern Ethiopia lives in homes and goes to school in buildings that are made of mud and sticks. And they're amazingly durable for what they are, but yeah. could be better. Yeah, and imagine what that does for those people, you know, having a home that they sleep better in and they, they don't get sick in, so right. it matters. Don't right. have rats in and things like that. <laughs> so I know Gabby has a question. Yeah, I have a, a couple of questions, but I'll try to keep it to one um, <laughs> quickly. So um, how do you actually prioritize like your funding and where do you build, right? Like I think you're mentioned to a few countries in Latin America, now a few relationships that you have had with Africa. But let's say we were to, you know, be able to crowdfund and give you X amount of money. How do you prioritize? Where do you put those, those houses, if you will? Totally. Um, so we're always vetting projects. Um, you know, the, basically how we chose to work in Mexico, Haiti, and El Salvador was part need. Obviously, there was great need in these countries. Part willingness of the local governments to work with us. I think what we're trying to prove right now and what's so unique about our organization is that there really isn't an organization working across governments, nonprofits, innovators, private companies doing these tech innovations. So like it really depends on the government and their willingness to work with us. And we hope that through our work, we'll prove enough that everybody will want to work with us and welcome us as almost a consultant, right? Um, so that's part of it. And then the other piece that's actually probably the most important is our local partners. I mean, we have a local partner in every country that we work in, um, some of the best in each country that have been doing, you know, relief, uh, community work, some do housing, maybe they don't have the funds to work with the people who are in the most poverty. So we worked with an organization in Mexico called um, Echele Atucasa, and they do affordable housing already, but they do not have the funds to really target people at the lowest rung of poverty. And so New Story is able to come in, offer extra dollars and work with them to find the people that they already know, already have surveyed and worked with, um, and actually offer them a home that they could not have done normally. So we have people on the ground that know way more about the culture, way more about the governments and about these relationships than we ever could. And that is how, you know, we basically get our foot in the door and start having these conversations. 
Excellent. So I, I know that uh, Cool Deep has a question, so let's turn to him. Uh, yes, thanks so much. Um, so I was wondering, given that you operate in developing countries, there can be power outages and heat and whatnot that you have to deal with, you know, which may delay printing. So I'm wondering if you've thought about, maybe you have, um, using solar panels so that you can collect uh, power from solar panels and then if the power goes out or machines overheat, et cetera, you can somehow use that solar-based energy to keep running the machines? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think there's a, there's a few pieces to this. First of all, we are definitely exploring solar panels. I'm honestly not exactly sure where we are in the process there because we're, we're working in a place that we, we know we have power to start with. But for Haiti, for example, we would not have access to power and we would need solar or some other form of energy to run a printer. Um, Haiti, you know, just for example, we have no running water or electricity in most of our communities there because the infrastructure is so poor. Um, so we're just not able to do that. But the other way that this printer can work without solar panels is, high, you know, big generators. And that's essentially like how we are supplementing power and doing additional power now. But the goal, I think, would be that you basically have a truck that has solar panels on it. That's kind of your charging and storage unit. And you could drive that into a community in Mexico where it's 100 degrees, charge up your panels and have both solar and generator power to, to keep things running smoothly. Excellent, thank you, Kuldeep. Um, last question uh, before we, we finish up the recording, although I'm guessing that we could probably take your entire afternoon with, with the, uh, the raft of I'm questions that, question. that I know people have. Um, and, and that is this, it, it, it's certainly honorable to, to want to have a 100% uh, model related to, uh, to donations going to projects, but an organization also has overhead. How, how, do, how do you square that away? How do, how do you establish funding for those things which aren't directly to going to projects? Yeah, great question. I think this is um, honestly like the 100% model as a whole is one of the, the keys of news story and Charity Water does something similar, but we basically have about 60 donors that are part of this builders program and they're doing anywhere from $50,000 or more per year for three year commitments. And so we have consistent recurring revenue and all of that money goes into R&D as well as team salaries. Um, so it's a little bit different in that we're not working with individual donors with different skin in the game. It's a dedicated group of 50 or 60 pretty ultra, net, or ultra high net worth accomplished people that are actually advising, checking us, <laughs> making sure we're not overstepping our bounds and helping us on the way. So, you know, it's two parts. It's building that group. And then it's also building this new group we have called the architects. And the architects is more about building in the communities but also kind of being partners in innovation and understanding what we as an organization are working on and piloting. And we kind of focus that conversation on these two groups that we trust and they trust us um, because those are kind of complicated situations. And it takes people that are involved over multiple years to really understand why we do and why we spend the money the way we do. Very cool. Well, what I'd like for our, our uh, participants and our viewers to do is if you are watching this as a recording, as a part of our weekly program, we hope that you will do two things. First of all, scroll down and let us know you are here. Even if you have, you know, just kind of run across us for the first time or anything like that, tell us. It's, it's good for us to know uh, who, who drops by. And visiting Rotarians, if you type your email address in correctly, you'll get an email that you can pass along to your club secretary for a a makeup of a miss. Farther down, you'll see our discuss forum for ideas related both to this program and the rest of the meeting. And we hope you will uh, not only share your thoughts there, but uh, respond to others who have who have thoughts there as well. We always like to uh, to leave the last word to our speaker. And so, before we finish up the recording, I hand it back over to Sam. Sam, you have the last word. Um, let's see here. I guess I think um, if I really had to draw, draw your attention back to something about this, you know, the, the printer is what I think everyone thinks is, is unique and buzzworthy. And I think it is, it's really brought us on the map. But what really makes New Story special is, is the attitude and the mentality and the unique space that it fits in. Um, I think nonprofits as a whole are less modern. Um, it's a less modern model. It's not a modern business. And the way that we run our organization and how we sit across all of these other organizations working in housing 
I truly don't know if there is another organization that does that today. I do not think there is. So if we can really find all of these, these pioneers of innovations like Icon, um, like this company that's doing, you know, aerial like surveying of land, if we can bring all them together and then democratize that technology, that is so much more powerful than just a printer or this and that, because we need so many solutions to end homelessness across a planet that has so many different, you know, environments, climates, and cultures. Um, there's people right now that don't even want a 3D printed at home. They just want a normal one. So I think that's what's, what really shines um, about this organization. And that's what I'd like to leave y'all with. Nicely done, Shags. Everyone, we will see you next week.